Collier, 41 years of age, married with four children. At work, 1,200 feet below ground at the coal face of a Ronda pit. A few yards along this five-foot seam, his workmate Jim Hopkins, 31, married with two children. Two colliers, then, two of the 7,000-odd mine workers employed today in the Ronda Valley. Even with the mechanical aid of pneumatic pick and belt conveyor, it's still hard graft. It's a dirty job. It's dark. It can be dangerous. To do the work needs skill and strength. To do it daily needs quick wits and a rough-tongued philosophy and a rude, ready humor, often as dry as the pit dust itself. As they work below, or as they tramp back a mile or so along the tunneled roadway to pit bottom at the end of shift, these men are the present heirs of an ancient order that's lasted for a century and a half. A democracy of work shared by generation after generation under the earth. This is their story and the story of Ronva. And in its essentials, it's the story of all the valleys in the coalfield of South Wales. pass over Rigos Mountain, where over half a mile above that five-foot seam of coal. This is the fingertip of Ronza's northwest arm. Only 20 miles down the winding road is Cardiff and the sea. But up here, the wind blows over stones that saw the earliest life of man. And the valley is a carved and twisting gash in the moorland plateau, the flat top of North Lamorland. geologist, the tale begins in the rocks of Ronda. Well, the early beginnings of the story of the Ronda Valley can be taken back to at least 300 million years ago. A time geologically when most of the British area uh, was covered with extensive coal measure forests. Uh, each coal measure forest eventually decayed, giving rise to a great bed of peat, which was eventually to make coal and this land on which the forest grew subsided and the rivers brought down new sediment that covered the coal seam. Muds became mudstones, clays became shales, sands became sandstones. Towards the end of this coal measure forest period there a significant thing happened as far as the Ronda is concerned at least uh, there was a great period of deposition of sandstone. Sandstone uh, known as now as the pennant sandstone. And this is the rock which of course is the major scenic feature in the Ronda. And the rivers which have carved out our valleys have breached this plateau-like cover uh, giving rise to the now famous Ronda and Ronda Ronda and Ronda Vark valleys. Below the sandstone, the black seams lie, layer upon layer, a gigantic sandwich of coal upon rock upon coal, flattened and twisted by the weight of ages. 
Today, you can trace some of the upper measures along the valley side, where old levels pockmark the outcrop. But at the beginning of the 19th century, only a few black furrows broke the surface of the mountain turf. Above the untapped coal was land owned by great estates like Butte and Dunraven, leased out and worked by farmers and shepherds, a solitude of sheep walks and wooded hill slopes. The revolution that was to change it utterly began when the first industrial pioneer came to the valley. It began here at dinner, a century and a half ago. This patch of black shale on which I'm now standing is all that now marks the site of the first pit in Fonda. It was in 1809 that Walter Coffin of Bridge End left the family tannery to prospect for coal here at the lower end of the valley. He started with levels driven into the mountainside, tapping the two upper seams of coal. Then, in 1812, he sank this pit. Forty yards down, his men struck the rich Bordringer seam, the Ronda number three. It was this seam, nearly three feet thick, that became known throughout the country as Coffin's Coal. Early levels and the first pit made little difference as yet to the valley. It was still a rustic economy of sheep farming and forestry and domestic crops, and the crafts of Smith and Sawyer and Miller that sufficed a self-reliant community. This was Coffin's second pit in Fronda. It's walled up now and overgrown, but the shaft is still there, under the ferns and brambles, reaching down 80 yards to the tunnel roads below. Under this ground, with naked lights, and with only the most primitive ventilation, 300 men and over 100 boys hacked, sweated, cut the coal through the long hours of darkness. And along this narrow west bank of the river, between the two dinner pits, in company cottage or lodging house, lived the first mining community of the Fonda. It was the first smudge of dark mound and gray stone on the green pattern of the valley. much left of this first industrial chapter in the story. Much of the old Dinas lies flattened under post-war factory sites. Many of the Dinas people have been housed elsewhere. What's left is practically deserted, awaiting the council shovel and bulldozer, the stone debris along the riverside that once housed a harsh and vibrant life of its own. In the derelict cottages and the gaunt tenements, the windows are empty sockets, blind eyes now above an empty lane where once the coal trams groaned down the rough track to the canal and Cardiff. Once, every room here held a bed, and every bed a miner. Along the Dinas Road, the pubs still bear the names of the farmlands on which they were built. But they no longer slake the thirst and temper of that age of hard labor. Nothing remains of those first mining families of Ronda. Nothing but names lost in the crumbling burial ground below Ebenezer Chapel. These first people were country folk, laborers from the farms of Ronva and from the Vale of Glamorgan. Here, the godly among them set up a Methodist cause in 1825. At Cummer, a mile or so lower down the valley, the earliest non-conformist cause in Ronva had long been established. Farmers and their families, riding here on Sundays to worship at the Independent Chapel in the year 1847, could see below them as they rode, on the bank above the river, another pit being sunk. This was another and successful search for the number three seam. The monopoly of Walter Coffin and the growing sale of his house coal had brought up to Ronva a Cardiff shipping merchant, George Insole. It was Insole who sank the Cummer Old Pit and who sank two more pits within a few years. These first coal owners were speculators concerned with the profits of speculation. With cheap, unskilled labor and primitive methods, speed of output was the vital factor, not safety of working. Overmen and firemen were far too few. The working day was 12 hours and more. The atmosphere foul with gases and the lack of ventilation. And a quarter of the labor force was juvenile. Boys began at six years old, opening and closing the air doors. On them rested the safety of the workings. Out of the darkness of those early pits come the echoes of their voices, the Dinas lads, who gave evidence to the Commission on Child Labour in 1842. My name is Philip 
David, I am 10 years of age. I've been driving horses below ground three years. I work 12 hours a day. I never work at school. My name is Matthew Lewis. I began to work when I was seven. I was burnt by the, fi by the fire dam when I was winding the air door. Some others were burnt at the same time, one almost to death. It was these boys, pallid, stunted and broken before their time, and the brute strength and endurance of their fathers who raised the coal and built the fortunes of their masters. The first tram of coal raised in a new venture was a matter for celebration amongst owners and shareholders rejoicing safely above the ground. The summer explosion of 1856 that killed 114 men and boys was inevitable in these gas-ridden and ill-managed pits. The daily accident rate was appalling. Lacking all safety, men were crushed or burnt or suffocated or drowned. And with a packed jury at the inquest, there was no question of compensation awards against the owners or their managers. For widow or orphan, there was only the final humiliation of parish relief. But mining, with all its brutal profit and loss, was still confined to the shallow housed coal seams below Porth and Dina. The steam coal, which was already making the nearby Aberdare Valley prosperous, was still to be found in Rhondda. It was discovered first here, at the top of the Rhondda Vaur at Treherbert. In his diary, W.S. Clark, mineral agent to the Butte estate, records, 16th of October, 1851, we commenced sinking the pit at six o'clock this morning. Here, below this ground, the upper four feet seam of steam coal was proved at a depth of 125 yards. By 1855, the colliery was complete, and on December the 21st, the first train of 38 wagons of Ronza steam coal went down the newly opened railway to Cardiff. This was the turning point. Under the farmlands and sheep walks, up and down the length of Ronza, the big deep shafts were driven to the steam coal, down to the two feet nine and the four feet and six feet seams. In 20 years, 25 new pits were at work in the two valleys. To the men who owned the lands or mineral rights of Ronda, men like Lord Bute or David Davis of Flandinum or the coal exporting brothers John and Richard Corey of Cardiff, here was a measureless reservoir of wealth. Year by year, as the sinkings continued and new seams were opened, revenues and sales and profits rose to new and gratifying heights. In Cardiff and in the Vale of Glamorgan, the mock medieval castles and stately houses flourished, well away to the south of the valley that paid for them. Absenteeism in Ronza began with the owners. But some were local and stayed. Some were immigrants who stayed. A Scot, for example, who gained a monumental place, Archibald Hood from Ayrshire. In 1864, he struck the deeper steam coal measures below Suna Pier to found the Glamorgan Colliery and the township that rapidly grew up around it. Hood settled at Glyn Cornell. The men who came to work for him were housed in humbler fashion. The hasty rows along the side of the hill above the pit became the pattern of Ronza housing the terrace. Over the mountain in the twin valley of Ronsavach, David Davis of Blangwaur and his son Louis Davis sank the first pit at Ferndale. Above the pit across the valley stood the colliery offices. Today, small boys and wandering sheep have shattered the windows and ravaged the interiors. All that's left is a debris of forgotten paperwork and the memories of past profits. And memories, too, of the human cost of coal, the long list of fractures and amputations, the record of accidents that marked a man for compensation. And above the offices, the family house, now derelict, and soon to be rebuilt by local authority as a home for the old. A final act, perhaps, of compensation. Lower down the valley at Anasir, we can see this proximity of pit head and big house 
as it must have been in the latter half of the century. James Thomas began life as a door boy and hewed coal himself until he'd saved enough to begin a mining venture at T. Newis. In 1877, he sank the standard colliery here. To local owners like these, there was a paternalism within limits. The limits allowed by Victorian ideas of the right relation between capital and labor. The masters, even the local ones, were screened by distance and by social position from the people who manned their pits. What sort of people were they, these miners and their families of a century ago? And how did they live? There's one Victorian observer. In the good times of coal, a few of the colliers were provident and put by money for a rainy day. But the mass spent their money lavishly. But two strikes in demand of better pay and a bitter five-month lockout in 1875 must have left little money for extravagant living. The strikes won a brief pay increase. The lockout that followed ended in new wage cuts, sent women and children to the tips scavenging for coal and broke the miners' first attempt at industrial union. The folk who were not chapel goers were catered for by the public houses. There was much drinking. Pay was fortnightly, and on those pay Saturdays, as they were called, disreputable scenes were common, remarks another observer. Certainly there was distraction in violence, in the dogfight or the barefist battle on the mountain. <laughs> Social life reflected the even greater violence of working life, as pits grew deeper so they grew more dangerous. Two great explosions in two years at Ferndale claimed 231 lives. In the second half of the century, 800 miners died in colliery explosions in Ronva. The numbers who died in individual accidents underground during those years will never be known. In one year alone, 1887, the South Wales Miners Provident Society dealt with 10,000 cases of disablement. One man injured in every four who joined. And in that year, fatal accidents placed on the funds 74 widows and 161 children. And rough printed ballads and broadsheets hawked about the valleys at a penny a copy made crude memorial for the dead. But every disaster brought its tale of courage, and none finer than at the flooding of Tinewith Pit in 1877. While officials and doctors waited above, the rescuers, working in ceaseless relays and without regard for their own safety, fought to reach their trapped comrades. After ten days and nights, four men and a lad of sixteen were plucked, still living, from their tomb of rock. Five had died in the first rush of water, but the survivors and their rescuers had become national heroes and were posed in solemn fashion before the cameras of the day. like Isaac Pride and Happy Dodds are legends still in Romva. Among those men at Tinoes was a colliery manager, Daniel Thomas, awarded the Albert Medal for his gallantry. At the Dinas explosion two years later, he led the rescue efforts, and he died leading a rescue team into the after damp at Penagraig in 1884. And around his memorial are the names of those who died in the Dinas pit, buried here in a mass grave on the hillside. lie the past generations, many of them people who came here in the booming years of the steam coal sinking. They came at first locally, tramping over the mountains in search of work from the declining ironworks of Merthyr and the older mining districts. Peace rates and day wages were often 25% higher in Ronza than elsewhere. As more pits were sunk, migration into Ronza became a flood from all parts of Wales and from beyond its borders Leaving the wretched poverty of the land, the laborers and their families poured into the valley. In 1870, there were 20,000 people in Ronza. In the next 10 years, the population more than doubled itself. By the turn of the century, 113,000 lived in the two narrow valleys, a cross-bred mixture with a strength and vigor all its own. Among those immigrants were the ancestors of Will Whitehead, miners' leader. My father worked in the pits in the Ronda. <coughs> As a matter of fact, he left the Forest of Dean, an agricultural area, 
to come to Rhonda because there was coal in the earth. My mother too, uh, she came with her family, or at least her family came before her, uh, down to the Rhonda in order to uh, open pits. They came down with the Davis Londinum family. And uh, both came from areas where the land offered little reward for working people. And they were determined to come down to what was virtually the Black Klondike. This Black Klondike bore all the signs of greedy haste in the making. Most of the trees were stripped from the mountains for pit props. The mining waste was spilled in great tips over the green slopes. As in the early days at Dinas, some of the owners held their mineral rights under short lease, and their sole aim was to get the coal out quickly. In the 60s and 70s, few owners did more than throw up wooden huts or a few streets of cottages for their first workmen. The vast majority of Ronza houses were built by private, speculative builders. Mostly, they used the local pennant stone for the small five-roomed houses. Street upon street, terrace above terrace, they shaped the urban straggle that is Ronza's present legacy. And there were never enough houses. In that explosion of population in the 80s, in almost every home there were lodgers. Beds were often occupied day and night, and the valley stood high on the blacklist of Victorian overcrowding. This teeming life was often rude and sometimes riotous, yet many of these immigrants brought with them a native culture already formed and a stern faith in nonconformity. In Tonpentra, for example, the Reverend Alban Davis explains the beginnings of community. It must be remembered that the coal industry developed itself as far as Arfanda is concerned around the pits. It is a succession of villages. The people came from, in particular, they came from the west, from Carmarthenshire, Pembrokeshire and Cardiganshire. They brought with them their own customs and they brought with them, likewise, their own denominational belief. The result was that every denomination had its setting within the particular village. In the first creative stage in the life of the community itself, the churches played a dual task. Concerned of necessity about worship, but also about sustaining and developing the cultural life of the people. The whole life of the valley, as it were, centered around the churches and there were definitely in the center. One must remember also that the churches contain the two elements, both master and masters and men. These new masters or pioneers actually were radical nonconformists who sought the new liberty to establish and to discover ways of adventure and investment. These men were regarded almost in a feudal fashion by the miners themselves. In those early days, it was possible for masters and men to worship together and to sing together in the great singing meeting, the Kamanvagani. Uh, I, I suppose one of the most remarkable commanders ever uh, uh, took place at Carmel to Herbert not long after the Kama disaster when Dr. Joseph Parry had written an anthem, which I think it was called the Miners' Anthem, and incorporating the hymn which the entombed miners sang as they awaited the deliverance. Well, this so gripped the, the choir and congregation that they kept on repeating it and repeating it until eventually, I understand, it was sung about 17 times. By the time they'd come to the end, the conductor himself were lay exhausted in the pulpit and the singing was going on regardless. The ministers of those days were eloquent patriarchal figures. As conductor and schoolmaster Jack Hayden Davis claims, they were the real leaders of their communities. They were the focal points of culture. For instance, uh, I myself was taught by uh, my minister, Sir Reverend Cannon Evans, G and L, not gin and lime as some of the wags said, but uh, graduate and licentiate of the Tonic So Far College as he taught me and gave me really the only musical certificates that I possess. Uh, also we were taught in school by the uh, class teachers. But one of the notable names I think was that of Moses Owen Jones, M.O. Jones, M.O. 
who came to Treherbert in about the 1860s. He was a pioneer composer, and his interest in music and uh, his friendship with a, a local printer, the Isaac Jones of Caxton Press, led to the uh, installation of the first press that could print tonics so far in Wales. And it's uh, a fact that at one period, all the Gamandragani programs in Tonics so far were printed at Caxton Press to Herbert. In the last of the Victorian years in Ronza, this chapel-based culture with its stern disciplines and rigid code of behavior was the strong core of community life. For most of these people, there was work to be had and pay to be earned. There was food for the large families, the families that bred more miners in their turn, as a retired miner like Sam Samuels remembers. But there's one thing about it, we always had plenty of food. Always had, because my father was a good worker. Well, he was a miner all his life, he liked his pint of beer. Drank a lot of beer in his time, no doubt about it. But to me, he was a good father. I don't think any of us children want to complain anything at all about him. We was all told, uh, 18 in family. There were seven, seven brothers and nine sisters. And a very good mother. For Sam and for many a lad like him, school days were short. And he was down the pit with his father at 11 years of age. In those days, the need for work and the money it brought into the family meant an early end to childhood. My grandfather used to tell me that when he started work in the Chidrao Colliery, where, by the way, four successive generation, four father, generations of my family worked one after the other, uh, he used to be carried to work as a boy of seven or eight in the winter time, half asleep over his father's shoulder, descend the mine on a Monday morning before dawn, come up after sunset, and so on through the week. And the only the, he thought that Sunday was so called because it was on that day only in winter time that he saw the sun. As Ronza moved into the 20th century, the pattern was laid, the mold hardened. Pit and terrace, pub and chapel became the shape and substance of the long, winding street. Ahead lay the struggles and the bitter breaking of the old order, the stormy path to Tonopandi and the lean and angry earth. I came here about, with my parents about 62 years ago, as a boy of 13, to work in the mine. And you know, when I look back and think of those hard work, low wages, the struggle to make ends meet, <laughs> I sometimes wonder whether I, whether we, how we survived it all. But we did, you know. The mine has always been a fighter, and he still is one if there's need to. When I started as a boy, my wages was a shilling a day, coming lights and opening doors. And believe me, little boy comes from the country, never heard the language we heard then up there as we did in the mines. I came one of the finest curses that ever went in the ground. And Halliers at that time, you know, they were wonderful characters. They always used to tease me, to get me out of temper, just to hear me cursing. And uh, I started to chew buckle. 
They caught all of me when they had put, put me on my back, put the two back on your mouth, and kept me there like you did. And boy, boy, wasn't I sick. But I had the taste of it, and I carried on with it. Well, I had about eight or nine lamps by my side, you know, hanging in a sort of a manhole. And if a collier came around, of course, no lamps for colliers, only for alias. If he had tobacco, he'd have a lamp. No tobacco, no lamp. Well, I was doing that job about six months. Then I came to Turkey, and I had a job with the presenter of the Methodist. And there was a good boy with him. And with him I worked until I was about 18. Then I had a place of my own. A boy like Prussell Williams, growing up in Ronza at the beginning of this century, well knew his working destiny. And school was only a short interval between the cradle and the pit. But for the children of the valleys, as Jack Hayden Davis recalls, the game of life began in the street. There we, on a winter's night, we would gather under the lamppost or around the window of the little shop, the little street shop, and uh, that was the meeting place of the gang, of the street gang. We had our own games, uh, daylight games, and games after dark as well. I suppose cat and dog would be the great daylight game, marbles, uh, one and over, the host of names that come back, they've all vanished now because, mainly because of the, the traffic making the street a very dangerous place to be in. But uh, street life was a great, great part in, in our existence. Uh, there were no cars. Uh, you just had the horses and the, and, and, and the, and the traps and the, and the carts. And so there was no difficulty at all in playing uh, any of these uh, uproarious games. Uh, in, in, in the streets and in the same way you were always susceptible to the temptation to go up to the uh, pit and uh, make yourself a nuisance by playing around amongst the trams and if you were very quick of course spotting the, the, the bobby who would chase you off the premises. Then of course there was the mountains, uh, we, we loved going up to the mountains and playing on the mountainside and some of the streams were still fishable and uh, during the fine weather, it was uh, very pleasant indeed uh, to go there and uh, with your ducking drawers and, and dive in and, and, and swim about and plash by way, I suppose, of being uh, a rehearsal to the great time when you would go down with a Sunday school trip uh, to Barry or Fourth Gall and swim around in the great big sea itself. Youngsters at the junior school at Ustrad still play as happily as they did when Sir Ben Bowen Thomas went there as a boy. But those dominant shadows of Shaft and Pithead no longer lie across school days or over the home itself. The uh, whole of my home was dominated by the fact that my father earned his living in, in the coal mines. He would come in as black as the ace of spades uh, of an evening, a late afternoon, and the whole uh, household would be concerned to return him to the, to, to, to the white colour and my mother would be concerned to get the dirty clothes out of the way and uh, well shaken and aired and prepared for the, for the morning. And then I would hear him uh, go out, in a, uh, I suppose sometimes even before six o'clock in the morning uh, to his uh, work. And what happened in the mines was, was the thing that uh, uh, really colored the whole of our lives. In these streets, in these closely packed houses, life achieved a great sense of solidarity and of genuine concern for the members of each family. My mother always regarded Friday night as set aside to go to her sister's house to help with the repairing of the clothes, children's clothes, the washing of the clothes perhaps, to um, help in the, the baking, making cakes or possibly bread uh, for the family. And then the other elder sister would probably go up on the Monday morning to give a hand with the large wash of this large uh, family. Uh, women took a great deal of pride in having a big family and it was a pleasure to see them going to chapel on a Sunday with all the family together filling probably up about two pews. It was a, a great accomplishment then to be the mother of eight or nine or ten. But today, of course, things are different. Today, the woman that had eight or nine or ten children is looked upon with a great deal of disdain and contempt. And the pride of place today, and the boast undoubtedly with many women is that they've only got a family of two, what is what they call a pigeon pair. As Yari Thomas says, there was pride in family. Pride too in a respectability as sharply defined and firmly based as the community itself. To many, the new century looked fair and prosperous, even adventurous and go ahead. 
when, up the main street and around the gossip's corner, tramway lines were laid, and the first trams rattled their way to the top end of the valley. There was pride in appearance, pride in a brave turnout of volunteers like these, ready for any emergency, even if performance sometimes dimmed that brassy splendor. And the pawn shop was a reminder that pride was still based on the uneasy economics of coal. But the big events were still domestic rather than economic. The long and solemn funeral, perhaps, most of all. It appealed to a people often close to the realities of death and loss. And dominating the scene, like great tents of stone, were the chapels, now in their spiritual and physical heyday. This is Neboastra, the uh, mother church of the Baptist churches in the Rhondda Valley, and uh, the place where uh, I was brought up in uh, a religious sense. Uh, it would be difficult to uh, overestimate the uh, meaning of an institution of this kind uh, to the folk of those days, because it was here that they identified themselves with uh, a framework, with an outlook, that gave meaning to their lives, that gave purpose to their lives, and that, that would then activate them in their relationships with their members and in the way in which they would personally try to conduct themselves. And in addition, of course, within the church, all kinds of activities, apart from the preaching services and the Sunday schools, to enable uh, young people to uh, use and to develop the gifts that were in them. Much of the social entertainment of the day was still chapel-based. The popular playhouse, like the old Theatre Royal at Tonopandi, was still regarded with suspicion by the devout chapel-goer. But these were days in which the melodrama of real life was gathering its own momentum. Well, I suppose that the melting pot of Rhonda reached its highest temperatures in the early to early years of this century, say from 1900 on, when we had terrific clashes between the incoming people from different parts of the world, people with different interests. It was a violent time, violent in religion with, with, with uh, religious revivals, violent on the political side with the, the riots and uh, all the rest of it. And then, of course, we had the great vigor of competitive singing. I suppose choirs formed themselves mainly around the chapels in those days, and uh, competition was a, was, was, was a terrific thing. We had a choir in Vanacombe Chapel of 400 voices at that time, conducted by a young man, uh, Evan Watkins. Well, he was actually 16, which was called Cora Crutton. And there, their famous piece was another violent piece of music, which was called Stone Him to Death. In 1904, the religious revival flared briefly into emotional life. One can speak of the revival itself as being an organized effort on the part of the churches to renew its defenses against the new political spirits. It was an emphasis upon saving souls, an emphasis on other worldliness, and once souls, so to speak, had been saved, and once they felt that their future had been laid up in heaven, uh, there was little else left for them by way of direction uh, from the church and from the pulpit in regard to life in this world. And after all, it's life world that is of significance uh, to uh, us as human beings. And it so happened that at that very same time, there was developing in politics and economics uh, a creative movement for social betterment, uh, which I am sorry to say uh, wasn't uh, taken into the church to the measure that it might have been, uh, with the result that it developed apart from it. And so you had uh, many of these young men uh, actually disowned by the church, the young men who went in uh, to uh, radical politics, to the ILP, to syndicalism, and later into what we call labor politics and poss possibly the communist movement. That is, the young people whom I used to listen to talking up by the Bridge End Hotel in Tonpentre or on the mountainside in Penrhys, people calling the workers to work out their own salvation. There is a great date in the life of the valley. It is the date of the, the year of the Tonopandi strike. Now there you have the division and the final division and separation between the churches and the new radical elements.
down there to my left is Dunraven Street, one of the main shopping streets in Vonda. Northwards that way lies the road to Philippeer and Tontentra. And up that steep hill there, past the smart new flats and the smart new club, is the way to Kiddach Vale. Down that narrow street a few months ago came the silent army of Ronza miners, escorting their dead comrades from the Cambrian pit to their long home on the mountainside at Triallo. They walked in sorrow where their fathers marched in anger. For this is Pandy Square in Tonna Pandy. This was the storm center in the days of the Cambrian Combine Strike. Because of what happened here, the date 1910 and the name Tonopandi are forever part of the racial memory of these mining valleys. The road to Pandy Square and to the great outburst of industrial and political violence starts a long way back from the Tonopandi of today. Outside the pub on the square, the men still squat, minor fashion, and talk together with the same dry, bantering humor. But the talk is not of old battles, or of the men who led the strife. Ronza today has little time for history, said one of them. The past is behind us. Let it stay that way. The older men, sunning themselves on the benches, will point out the first shop window smashed in the riots. But the names of the past leaders stir only faint memories now. Names like Ablett and Rees, Hopler and Smith, that were once the ready coin of argument. Perhaps from one of them, there'll be a word about Mabon. A very fine old gentleman, one of the best gentlemen, no doubt, we've ever had in the Ronda here. Well, in fact, we had one day on a Monday, and we had a stop day for it. And they call that Mabon's Day. That was a holiday. William Abraham, the legendary Mabon. For 50 years, a trade union leader. For 35 years, member of parliament for Ronda. His counsel was always conciliation. His slogan, half a loaf is better than no bread. He became the miners' representative on the Joint Sliding Scale Association. This pegged wages up or down to the selling price of coal and gave 17 years of uneasy peace to the coal field. But younger leaders demanded that profits, not selling price, should determine pay. In 1893, the Holliers' strike brought violence and troops to the Ronda. In 1898, the sliding scale was abandoned and the South Wales Miners' Federation was born. As if in answer, the ruthlessly efficient D.A. Thomas, later Lord Ronver, began the grouping of pits that by 1910 had become the powerful Cambrian Combine. In 1905, two major explosions had shaken Ronver, at the Cambrian Pit, at Clidach Vale, and at Wattstown. Between them, they killed 150 men. In one street in Wattstown, every house mourned a man lost. Such disasters as these inflamed opinion, even amongst men hardened to the daily toll of accident. Uh, to see that procession coming from the colliery, uh, we knew that if the stretcher would be carried at waist high, that the man was only injured. If the stretcher had been carried on the shoulders, we knew that he had been killed. And the we were just children would walk behind, and very often we'd see the blood dripping ripping from the stretcher onto the floor and just see the boots of the man coming from underneath the sack. Finally, in 1909, came the Eight Hours Act. This reduced hours of work, but it also reduced earnings. Many older men were dismissed, there was still no payment for small coal, and, the vital sparking point of strike, no extra pay for work in bad scenes. Veteran miners' leader Will Mainwaring looks back now across the years at the relative strength of masters and men poised as they were for battle. When the uh, Cambrian Combine strike started, the Cambrian Combine Colliery Company was really in clover because the Coal Owners Association had agreed that they would subsidize the combine to the tune of two shillings per ton for all the coal that was not raised for a whole 12 months. You can imagine what it means. 12,000 miners, 12,000 tons of coal per day, 12,000 times two shillings a ton, right through the many months of that struggle. Now that's where the strength and the resources on the owner's side appear to be. On our side, trade unionism divided as it was then much more than now in South Wales, 
about 20 different districts Rwanda was simply one of them and the combine here was only a portion of this Rwanda now there was a problem if we were going to enter into the struggle the challenge was bound to come what resources had we well we had to make a very serious decision were we going to enter into a struggle and hope to carry it through and win on the basis of a strike pay we had none in august 1910 the spark was set to the powder at the naval colliery penagraig one of the cambrian combine pits 70 men demanded a piece rate of two and sixpence a ton to work the difficult butte scene the management offered one and ninepence a ton first the company to enforce the proper terms upon the nivel workmen tendered notices to 800 men naturally this aroused the opposition of nivel and the other combine lodges and we agreed decided unanimously that when the notices to the 800 came to an end that also would be the signal for a stoppage of the whole 12,000 men the story of the violence that followed the beginning of the cambrian strike is a tangled web of conflicting and far from impartial accounts certainly in that autumn of 1910 there was a brooding anger and great bitterness throughout mid ronza and large numbers of extra police had been drafted into the area in anticipation of trouble most of them were deployed to guard colliery premises and at the glamorgan colliery at luna pier the owners decided to maintain the pumps and ventilation by bringing in stokers from outside when on the night of the 7th of november the strikers learnt of this import of blackleg labor they marched on the colliery and fiercely attacked the police lodged inside after a sharp skirmish the strikers were driven off and more police were rushed into the valley on the following day a minor demonstration in tonopandi itself was broken up by repeated charges and the free use of police truncheons the miners fought back with fists and stones and there were broken heads and limbs on both sides of the battle during the day and night that followed windows were smashed and shops were looted hastily shopkeepers boarded up their windows and assumed a state of siege tonopandi was now no longer a local disturbance and the home secretary was asked for military aid he sent 500 metropolitan police with troops in reserve many in ronza have reviled this action of churchill's but will mainwaring takes a different view we never thought that winston churchill had exceeded his natural responsibility as home secretary the military that came into the area did not commit one single act that aroused the slightest resentment by the strikers on the contrary we regarded the military as having come in the form of friends in order to modify the otherwise ruthless attitude of the police forces at tonopandi and penagraig there was more violence at the end of november many strikers were arrested and sentenced officials at the pits manned the pumps under guard and all through the sullen months of 1911 troops and large forces of police remained in the valley the strike dragged on amidst a welter of manifestos and arguments negotiations between the south wales miners federation and the owners with the board of trade holding the ring continued in an atmosphere charged with fierce dispute the original demand of the men for fairer pay for working a bad or difficult seam was changed to a call for a minimum wage for all workers by august 1911 the strike was 10 months old in mid ronza there was intense and widespread suffering the impetus of violence slowly died as miners and their big families grew wretched with need the resources of the unions were almost exhausted in the local chapels men climbed the pulpit steps to receive their weekly strike pay now even this pittance was reduced the end was inevitable by september the men had accepted the owner's terms but to their leaders this was only an interval before renewing the struggle we were then satisfied time has now arrived when we can safely say we'll accept the terms that have been proffered to us we'll return to work and prepare for the other struggle which must come within three months and uh, one thing i was rather proud of um, the cumbrian my own lodge 
having been through the full 10 months struggle, only partially returned to work as yet. Indeed, I had still another year to go before I returned to work. But having done all that, we balloted the Cumberland miners. Are you now prepared to join in another strike? A struggle for the minimum wage. And the highest majority in the whole of Britain came from the Cameron Lodge. In support of a new and more militant unionism, Mainwaring and his fellow leaders set up the unofficial reform committee and published a celebrated and explosive pamphlet. The purpose we had in mind in preparing this miner's next step was to consider with our fellow miners everywhere does the existing trade union structure fulfill what you think is required? Or would you agree with us that we need a completely transformed structure of trade unionism, a new unionism for the miners of this country? And eventually, we appointed eight persons to summarize the whole thing and write it up in the form of a pamphlet. And thus, eventually, it became published by ourselves in time to influence the National Conference of the Miners of Great Britain and produced a national minimum wage under the then Prime Minister H.H. H. Asquith. So we had a final victory to what we had aimed to do. The Cambrian strike not only led the drive to a minimum wage, it also broke the power of the older miners' leaders in Ronva. Conciliation and arbitration were rejected by the younger elements, and Mabon's day was done. In 1912, the owners were faced with the first national strike of coal miners in Great Britain. For six weeks, conference and mediation failed to move either side until a government intervened and the principle of a minimum wage was accepted by Parliament. The year that followed saw the high peak of coal output. Nearly 10 million tonnes were raised in Ronda. Demand was high and so were profits but mining was still a cheap method industry. Well, the work on the ground of those days were very hard mine. The labourer's wage was only three and six to four shillings. The collier, of course, if you had a good seam of coal, you'd be all right. But if you had a poor seam, you had to live on what the coal he could produce, especially large coal, because there was no payment paid for small coal then, until the minimum wage act came in. And then it was much better because the same thing happened then. If you were a poor place, you wouldn't be able to make your money up to the minimum. You'd have to fight for it. And we had to fight. We used to stand on top of that pit, you know, clothes soaking wet, you know, with sweat. Wait for the manager to come up. And of course, he'd always stay down longer on a Friday than he would any other day, you see. Because he knew we were up there. And then the fire would start. An act of parliament was one thing. Getting your rights at the pithead was another. Yet these last years of peace in Europe were the halcyon days of the trade. Ocean and Insole, Ferndale and Standard, Corey and Cambrian. Truck after loaded truck spread a black trail to factory or docks. The whole motive force of industry came from the deep seams of places like Ronda. And across the seas, along the imperial trade routes, were the coaling stations, the great stores of bunker coal to feed the shipping of the world. In 1914, Corey Brothers alone owned 80 such depots, and the roaring furnaces of liners like Mauritania, breaking the record for the Atlantic crossing, were stoked on coal hewed in the pits of Park and Dare and Mainly. When it came, the war maintained the boom years in the valleys. Britain's great battle fleets were coal-fired, so were the factories of war. Although many Ronza men joined the forces, coal was so vital to the war effort that by the end of 1916, the government had limited the recruiting of miners. In light and heavy industry, women took over men's work. The miners returned to the pits, and by 1917, the industry was brought under national control. The Board of Trade regulated wages, conditions, and hours of work. Everything, except profits. And despite the names on the war memorials, these were good years for Ronza. But they were soon over. By 1921, Ronza was again on strike and marching to Watstown to call out the pump men. 
This national coal strike had followed the handing back of the mines to the owners and the drastic wage cuts that came from falling markets and rising costs. In bitter anger, the men demanded the pits be abandoned. Safety officials were forced out and Holliers brought up their horses to join the workless men on the surface. It lasted three months. In Ronza, strike action became a series of struggles to promote or to prevent the flooding of the pits. But despite protest and picketing, there was little violence. One national newspaper said, the 40,000 miners of the Ronza Valley are conducting themselves with commendable calm and not a single case of lawlessness has been reported recently. Some pits were flooded and once again troops and extra police came to the valley. The strike ended in hardship and defeat wage cuts and victimization. Once again, the people of Ronza had only themselves to turn to in their need. The feeling was very warm in the Ronda in those days. Much different to now. Everybody was so near to each other, and if they could do you a good turn, they would do it. But the neighbors were hard run. Everybody would help one another. in the Ronda were not prepared to go down in this struggle against uh, social unnatural forces. They recognized that they must have food, they must have houses, they must have clothing, clothing. These elementary essentials of life. And so they decided that if present society wouldn't give them, then they must change society. And this is what they set about doing. And Ronda became one of the most militant and at the same time probably the most democratic place on the face of the earth. Will Whitehead, miners' leader on the 20s and 30s in Ronda. Along this derelict and now deserted street called the Concrete, soon to be raised to the ground, you can still feel something of the atmosphere of decay and depression that began in the valley with the general strike of 1926. No one can credit how hard it was in the Ronda or the, in the two strikes. There was no opening at all to have or go anywhere until everybody had gone miserable. The men were very miserable. They'd hung around the corners from early to late, didn't know what just to do with themselves. They do a little turn down cigarettes, wherever it was possible to get them to job to do. There wasn't a lot around because everybody was in the same boat. All in the same boat too were the men who marched about the idle valley through that long summer. Men who were fiercely partisan and utterly committed to the struggle, right or wrong. I don't think it was the, uh, the wrong of the men. It was the wrong of the coal owners, it was. Not the men. Because well, the men were forced in the end to go back because of anger of the children. Given back the way. That's it. For the day. But in the beginning, there was a spirit amongst them of optimism and holiday, 
and a welcome chance to make sporting carnival. when the miners fought on alone, Ronza men were leaders, as grimly implacable as the owners who opposed them. Men like A.J. Cook, who had become secretary of the Miners' Federation of Great Britain in 1924. Noah Ablett, veteran of Tonopandi in 1910. And Arthur Horner, later to be champion of Ronza's unemployed. Unemployment on a national scale now became the post-strike pattern. This was a world adrift in an economic chaos to which there seemed no end or answer. In all the industrial areas of Britain, the queues lengthened through the years, the queues for relief, the dole queues that stretched wearily outside the labor exchange in every town and valley, the hopeless quest for work for anything, and the losing fight against poverty. There can be no argument or doubt about the evidence of poverty it was there for everyone to see in the faces of the children pinched and wan lackluster eyes on their claws which were the claws of adults cut down or else were the claws of older children and were ill fitting their shoes with the toes poking out of the front of the boots uh, then uh, there was the general uh, lack of energy with with the children if there was one consolation, it was that we were all poor together. And in times of strike, we all went to the soup kitchens together. <coughs> Every boy had the Tate and Lyle tin cut down to size and a handle of tin soldered on. And this tin was basin and cup together. His soup went into this tin and so did his cocoa at the soup kitchen. The soup kitchens have left with many in Romba the memory of pride swallowed with the stew and the cocoa. Memories of full bellies in an empty existence. For Yari Thomas, memories of the volunteers who ran them. Oh, the soup kitchens, of course, were um, well organized. Uh, we had uh, certain members of the lodge committee in charge of the provisions, doing the ordering, and you had others in charge of the fires. You uh, had some old boys who'd been in the army as cooks, volunteering to do that work, and used to come to the kitchens at five o'clock in the morning to prepare. And mind you, he took some preparation, too, because we had young lads then spending most of the mornings on the mountain playing football, coming down, of course, with a hunger. And by gosh, you ought to see the size of their basins when they come in to have those meals. It was the pride of most miners in those days, when wages were low, of course, they all had allotments. Well, when the strike came, and there was need for providing people with food, these men went to their allotments and brought their vegetables, cabbages, peas, potatoes, whatever they had, in order to help the soup kitchen to carry on its function. You can see marks on the mountains, it's exciting or no. Well, we, we've been digging the coal, sheltering for sheep, uh, sheep and all that it is now today, with grass going all over it. The coal was provided by men volunteering to go in rota to the mountains into these levels, and mind you, risking their lives. Some of them were killed, really, in these, in these levels. Some of them had their backs broken in their endeavor to get coal for themselves, of course, and a quarter was always given to the soup kitchens in order to feed the fires. The problem then was for desperate men to maintain their families, for the dole was little enough. So what did they do? They had to revert to desperate measures. There is one famous street in the Ronda. It has two or three names. Its proper name I shall not tell you. The two other names are Sheepskin Avenue or Mutton Tump. And it was known that in that street, 
Men used to take it by turn to kill the sheep and share the meat out amongst the families in the street. And the police never found out how they did it. Under the crude banner of hunger, desperate men marched out of the valleys to join other worthless comrades from Wales, from the Midlands, from the North, on the road to London, to publicise and proclaim their need. The hunger marches of the 20s and 30s spread a stain of shame over the face of Britain. They were the symbols of disaster in finance and trade, even more so, disaster in terms of human relations and the concern of man for man. Prior to the depression itself, as a miners' agent, I knew that there were 45,000 miners regularly employed and, of course, members of the organization. After this tremendous somersault in trading conditions, I found 35,000 miners unemployed. And you can imagine the social effect of such a situation. By 1932, over half of all the men in Ronza were out of work. Many of them were destined never in their lives to work again. Year by year, as they rolled by, these people, men and women alike, gradually settled down to the acceptance of the standard of life which was possible on the basis of unemployment benefit, in some cases, some additional assistance from national assistance. But how they settled down to that and lived as best they could. And at the same time, exemplary people in every, in every respect, fighting against misfortune. Gosh, what, what, what courage the people had. Yeah. I remember we were waiting for the Friday for the door. My husband would go to the shop and fetch just uh, sugar, butter, tea, cheese. And then the children would say, Now, Mum, for a nice dinner with fresh cheese and bread and butter. I remember we used to go down to the carry farms that on a Friday there used to be a, a market, I don't know, to jockey. And they would have a leg of mutton for about a bob. One and six. Two shirts for half a crown. Cheap fruit. Fish. I remember we used to go down on fish day and have a hake about a yard long, you know, for a bob. We'd sting it on our back and walk all the way to clear that. Well, of course, mind the family today won't see what we see. They are having family down in Dresden, which is a great boon to them. We have to keep our children on two shillings. And I had to send my children away when they were 14, my two girls who were in their own living. The plight of the miner came to the notice of the Society of Friends and of Emma Noble in particular, who got permission to come to Ronda on a three-week observation visit. She stayed with her husband among the Ronda miner for just under 20 years. As Glyn Jones says, the immediate task was material, to clothe children and parents in need, to distribute the help that now began to arrive from outside. But more than this, the Society of Friends set up an educational settlement at Meister Havre to help the rebuilding of local and communal life. Men were now anxious to get together in some sort of organization where they could uh, vent their feelings about the whole thing and try to do something about it. The establishment of unemployed clubs followed and grew up overnight. Many clubs sprang up like mushrooms overnight and we saw established in these centres in a very short time a boot repairing shop for the repairing of members' shoes and boots, the uh, workshop for carpentry where re household repairs could take place and uh, furniture made, and it is the proud boast of one young man at the time that he made every stick of furniture before he got married. And that furniture is still in use today. Oh, they were a big boon. Believe you me, our men would have gone out of their mind because it took them from their home because the woman could have never stood the strain of having the man in the home knowing how he felt because he wasn't working. So of course they turned to the unemployed club, which we've got to thank the Quakers for. And I think they deserve all the credit because it's through them that we've kept our reason. Then from the men's club, the women's club formed. And they helped to keep the women their morale up because otherwise I believe we would have cracked up. 
I said that we should we should be close enough to know. Already uh, the need for coal uh, was making itself felt in every household and permission was granted to unemployed miners to ferret out coal from the, the tips which have buried within them many tons of coal. Your husband, I don't mind telling you how to go to the tip. He has to sell a bag of coal and have help to bring in something for the children. I think that is the lesson of the Depression that in moments of material need and suffering, people have a concern, a genuine concern for others. That has been totally, perhaps a strong word, almost totally eclipsed uh, by the welfare state of today and this chasing after the bonus. The Miners Institute, with its library and reading room, became the Parliament of Poverty. Up the top of Rondevach, for instance, at Mardi, the workman's hall and its classes on Sunday afternoons bred a vivid consciousness of rights and wrongs. This, this is the famous classroom uh, at Mardi, where Arthur Horner and some of his conspirators, I think that's the right term to use, used to meet and discuss the affairs of the world. Uh, and a classroom it was in the very real sense. But the sort of things which were taught here were not the three R's, although they were part of it, but not them alone. What was taught here was economics, political economy, dialectical materialism, strange words these, uh, world history, amongst other things. And the emphasis was on ma the, the thoughts, the concepts of Marx and Lenin. Classes of this sort were common throughout the whole of the Ronda Valley in those evil days, uh, as much as anything because men had very little other places to go, and the institute was the focal point of social contact, as it were. But not only did they teach the social sciences there, they dealt with more practical day-to-day -day things. So many men were unemployed, and so many were on the means test, uh, that they were being denied the means of existence. And people like Arthur Horner and others, in such classes as this, taught men the unemployment uh, acts and taught them how to defeat the uh, ways of the insurance officers, taught them how to get more money for their families. And these were the sort of things which were, t which, were, were, which were taught to men in addition to the social sciences. It was in fact the adult university of the Ronda, the university of hard knocks. Few pits were working and they were on short time. A few nailed boots still rang along the streets, but to get a job at all was a matter of chance or favour. The queues on top of the colliery there, all waiting and queuing up for work. About 30, 40, even 50 men at a time, waiting for the manager to come out and select who you want. Here he come and you point, you, 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 three, four, perhaps five men, not many more. They turn around quite as if there's nobody there and say, well, you can all buzz off now, you have it. In those years of idleness, many a man, like Trevor Parker, turned to the lofts behind the terrace and to one of the miners' abiding hobbies. Keeping pigeons was our only little bit of pastime. We used to have our private little races. Penny, tuppence or thruppence entry of pigeon. We'd walk miles as far as Merthyr or Penderyn or anywhere that I could like, spin the knife just for the toss. Select two men who will let the birds go walk in there, have a little sweep. Well, it was all clean sport and nice bit of fun. On the weekend, we'd have a game of football. Uh, that used to be up in the old favourite place, up on the battlefield. We'd be starting about nine o'clock, half time. Would it be about roughly about two o'clock, half past two? We all have to retire for dinner. Back, a day, back again after dinner. So the second half, that would be roughly about six or seven hours of playing football non stop. Those were the brave days of carnival and jazz band competitions. The mocking derision of the gazooka was perhaps Ronza's reaction to depression and to a valley of workless men.
bad times or good, Ronda still bred its own kind of sportsman, equally at home on a rough mountain pitch as in a bad place underground. And above all, as Cliff Morgan claims, great fighters. And I look across from the Ronda now where I'm standing and look at Penrever where Tom Thomas, one of the great fighters of the old days, uh, used to wrestle with a bull to prove his strength before he pitted his skills in the ring against many and varied opponents. Uh, I think of Scarlet's fan, Jimmy Wilde. Jimmy Wilde, who one day said to me, Mr. Scarlet was a kind man, he used to get me in the ring, about 20 or 30 fights I used to have in one day. And one afternoon, having knocked out 10, Mr. Scarlet said, Done well, Jimmy, he said, now come down the caravan by with me and have a cup of tea and a bun. He went down on a cup of tea and a bun and came back and knocked out six more. The fairground boxing booth run by Scarrett was a tough nursery, not only for Ronva's champions, but for many a young lad like Reg Edwards, with handy fists and empty pockets. Scarrett was on the roster, shouting odds, and test the World Cup up, and we'd, we'd accept uh, the boxer of our choice. Usually the boxers that Scarrett took around to them were hard it as boys that were capable of stopping uh, their opponents. Very often, there were British champions being paraded, but the economic circumstances were so bad that you'd have a go at anybody to earn a pound. It is true that we were hungry, and we were mostly doing it for the money that was in it. In the 30s, one Ronza boxer came very near a world title. Tommy Farr of Tonopandy fought his way up to become our best heavyweight between the wars. Here's the victorious end of his first bout with Max Baer. But there were other fights, not for purses, but for principles. In 1935, for example, at the Dare Pit Compact. There was conflict then about what union the miners should join. And the miners in this pit decided, in order to establish their right to it, join the union they wanted, their own, they decided to stay down the pit. And 80 men stood down in this pit for nine days. And eventually they solved the problem by forcing the company to concede all their demands. And they earned the right to join their own union. Now this was a fight not for bread, not for wages, but for a principle. During those nine days and nights, the men down the pit, of course, had to pass the time away somehow, and they did it by holding concerts, competitions for singing and rhyming and limerick, and of course, you had undoubtedly the usual type of well story. And the final day, when they were about to come up the pit, they gathered at pit bottom, and Tommy Lewis Sugar, they called him, a musical conductor in the locality, called the men together and led them in singing the doxology. And people who were gathered at the pit head heard the strains of this music come up the shaft, which was the closing chapter in this epic. <laughs> blessings left for Ronda in those days. In 10 years, 20,000, mostly the young, left their homes and the endless idleness of the street corner and dole queue to find a living elsewhere. And they carried Ronda into dispersion. I personally organized two deputations to successive prime ministers. And I well remember Mr. Stanley, the Minister of Labor, in, 19, in 1935, telling the deputation that we should do everything in our power to get the men away from their misery. It was obvious that as far as the government was then concerned, that there was only one task to be done, and that was to take away the men and the young men and the young people from the valley itself. Now that migration became a definite flood. It was a one-way ticket and a one-way traffic. 
and those young men and young women were never destined to return. Most of the people of Veronda went away from here to Coventry, Birmingham and London, and they've never come back because they are better off there. I had the heartache to see so many going from here. I myself have never gone with all the archers. It robbed Rwanda of its most virile, the most promising of its population, leaving Rwanda sadly burdened with a, a, a larger percentage than should be of aged population. And so it continues up to this day, it's still affecting the situation here in Rwanda. The last of Rwanda's vigorous life drained away through the 30s, away from the silent tip and the gaunt and derelict shaft. Many of these pits were closed, never to reopen. The two Ronvers lay inert and helpless and dying. The first faint kiss of economic life came with work in factories outside the valley. In 1936, the Trafalgar Trading Estate was established, and light industry began to make some inroads into the numbers of workless men. By 1939, two factories had been built in Ronva itself. But until the war began, migration and unemployment continued. September 1939. Once again, war demanded coal, and the aging and almost worn-out pits were galvanized into activity. Dramatically, almost overnight, Ronza found itself re-employed. Now, hands grown soft in idleness hardened again at the coal face. Into the moribund coal field came life and purpose and wages. The call-up brought the Bevin boys to the pit to eke out a mining population shrunken by wastage. And after victory came vesting day. The nationalization of the industry in 1947 must have seemed a miner's millennium, a final lasting triumph. At last, the pits belonged to the people, what was left of them. In Ronda, area manager Gerald Blackmore talks of the position as the NCB found it in 1947. There were some 14 working units in the Rhondda Valley itself, employing some 14,000 people, and in the first year of nationalization, turned out about two and a half million saleable tons. And it's interesting to compare what the position is today, because during that period, the 14 pits have come down, and we now only have seven pits. And the interesting fact is, there are a little under 7,000 men. But despite this lower manpower, and the higher rate of absenteeism, we are currently producing some from the seven colonies, a million and a half tons. So this means that the productivity per worker in this period of 18 years has gone up by some 40%. Mechanization has produced new ways of working, like the two foot eight seam here at Cambrian. The working face is no higher than a tabletop. Under this low roof, miners used to crouch or lie prone for hours, cutting coal by hand. Now the steel plow rips along the hundred yard face gouging the coal onto the belt conveyors. The miner at last has adequate tools for his trade. Above ground too, wherever it's economically possible, there's been modernization. With Mardi's new look pit, the best example in Romva. Mechanization is a very wide subject and is not purely confined to coal getting on the face by machine. Um, no doubt you'll remember years ago men used to do an awful lot of hand tramming but on the modern pit today you will find that at pit tops and pit bottoms trams are moved by mechanical means uh, likewise in the old days the coal was conveyed from the face to the pit bottom in trams whereas today there's a growing tendency for either um, locomotive haulage to be used but more particularly um, belt conveyed from the coal face right to the pit bottom where it's loaded all these are factors of mechanization, uh, in addition to coal-faced mechanization, where, of course, the productivity, both in this valley and all over the country, has uh, led the world in terms of new techniques to um, get coal at the cheapest price and equate against this receding manpower force. There lies the problem. The pool of labor, skilled and unskilled, that for so long sustained the pits of the valley is drying up. Mechanization can replace manpower, but only up to a certain maximum point. I believe the conditioner for the future rests in the manpower position. We have had this tremendous rundown in manpower in recent years, um, and in the end you can't work pits without men. 
no matter how much you do in by way of mechanization at the coal face and elsewhere, you are dependent on men in the bitter end. In the end, it depends on men like these, on Di and Jim and their comrades still at work in the Ronda today, the minority that remains of what was once the great majority. because you've got punches, cutters, and all the rest of it to assist you. But still, the tempo have increased. Therefore, it's been clearing. I mean, years ago, you used to go to work, and if you could only fill three, ten a coal, which is like ten a coal. If you could fill ten, which is ten. If you was working, to your own capability. Today, you're expected to keep up to time. Everything is worked on the clock. Two Romba miners driving home from what is still a major industry in the valley. Gone forever from these streets are the coal-blackened faces, the rough working clothes, and the tramp of nailed boots that mark the shift coming home. Gone too, perhaps, with the old working method, is the pride of craft now replaced by the discipline and teamwork of a mechanized coal face. What used to be in hard necessity, the hereditary job, no longer descends from father to son. There are other jobs, and Ronda parents have long memories. One of our biggest problems in juvenile recruitment is from uh, the attitude of parents who recognize the fact that before the war, uh, for 70% of males, it was either a question of working in the mining industry or, or being on the dole. And whilst it's unfortunate, one must recognize that this is the backcloth and, uh, under which and against which we must have a recruitment program. Uh, I would believe that the uh, vast majority of trade unions today recognize the fact in the Ronda that uh, they do get a fair deal from the coal industry. And I would say from the recognized leaders, it does not prejudice their attitude to the industry to any marked extent. But as a labor-dense industry, we have to have people. And our recruitment program is certainly prejudiced by the attitude of people who remember the past, which I do not believe, relative to the attitude of the board, since nationalization is fully justified. It's in the miners' lodges that local attitudes are still decided. In the past, these were the rallying grounds of defiance. Today, they consult with management. They deal with welfare and cases of compensation. And their vital concern is with the threat of pit closure and the fear of redundancy. Like management, they're well aware of the drift away from the pits and the daily absence, as the area manager claims, of one Ronda miner in every four from his place of work. The absenteeism has increased since nationalization from about 10% in this community to a current figure of 24. Uh, and uh, when one asks the reason why, um, I think this is largely a matter of opinion. By and large, the whole prosperity of the area has risen tremendously during this period. The, I think a big factor must be the amount of the female population which is currently in employment in Rhonda. This increases the overall um, income coming into the house. 
and therefore I think this tends to um, encourage uh, absenteeism to some extent. Uh, one thing that uh, I feel one must comment on, that mining is to some extent um, a more dangerous industry than others, and certainly the higher rate of absenteeism must in the end prejudice the safety of everyone employed underground. People moving from one job to another because of absenteeism must give rise to some lack of safety which would not take place if people work more regularly. Recruitment, absenteeism, safety in these pits, after nearly 20 years of nationalized coal, problems like these still have to be resolved in terms of the relations between coal board and coal mining. As union leader Will Whitehead sees it, attitudes have changed. But so too has the industrial and economic background of the Collier's life. Uh, in the past, the uh, attitudes were very clearly defined. The enemy was the coal owner. Uh, to put it uh, in a nice way, the devil wore a big moustache. Uh, it was possible uh, to uh, define him because however much he suffered, we who were employed by him suffered more. And so there, there was no doubt about what we had to do, we had to oppose him and try to win from him greater wages, more reforms, etc., uh, etc. Et but today, you see, the enemy, if he is to be the employer, is the National Coal Board. And we, the miners, fought for nationalization. And we must defend nationalization. So the lines are not clearly drawn at all. And however much nationalization has given us, and it has given us much, the five-day week, the rest day, it has started on fringe benefits, given us better holidays, however much it has done. The mining industry still has to compete commercially in this country. And as a consequence, because it has to do that, it still hasn't got the, the money to give us the other reforms which we require. And so, rather than strike, as they did in the old days, uh, when there was no other industry about, men are choosing to leave the mining industry and go to work in much more congenial conditions, in factories, mills, workshops, and what have you. So you see, there is this marked difference today. Uh, the militancy is there, but they're not called upon to use it because of alternative means of employment are available to them. For many former miners, alternative employment means commuting to work elsewhere. Nearly half the men of the Porth and Penagraig district, for example, now work outside the valley. In Ronda itself, 23 factories have been built since the war to provide a variety of work for women as well as men. In a clothing factory like this, special shift times have been arranged to suit working mothers. The emancipation of smaller families and the new equality of the female wage packet means the women are better off. Oh, a lot better off. Everybody is better off. The Ronda is better off. The factories have come here for the women to work and to earn money. The work is so much easier than in my time. And everybody is renovating up their homes and much more independent. Today, the valley's face is changing from old chaos to new order. The drab Victorian sprawl is disappearing under a modern pattern of industry and the character of the townships and villages that thread the long street is changing too. Villages like Coombe Park, for example, where Yari Thomas lives. Yes, I think that this uh, village of Coombe Park uh, is a kind of a microcosm that reflects the changes that have taken place throughout the run as a whole. Now, take this pit here, dead. It's just scrap iron and junk. There were three pits there in this village, but only one is left now. And you can see this decline of the village reflected in its institution. The social life that was rooted in non-conformist faith, the societies based on the chapels, the big choirs, the drama groups, the meetings, sacred and secular, all have broken down into a new and looser social pattern. There's a kind of a fragmentation. Uh, people are leaving the village, especially the young men and women. And that is a tragedy that the young breeders, the fertile groups are going, and all that's left behind are the old hens. Up and down both valleys, the workmen's institutes were once the keystones of a self-made and radical society. Today, they must survive on the profits of the bar and the one-armed bandit. 
Today, the rooms where workless men in the 30s read everything from Hansard to the Christian Herald are storage space for beer glasses and bingo cards. And in the library, the cupboards are closed. Now, no hand pulls down a book in strong support of argument. The dust gathers on those articles of faith as it seems to have gathered on what was once the ardent radicalism of Ronda. That there are those who have held that the intense radicalism of the Ronda uh, belongs to the days of the have-nots. And that uh, the socialism which was practiced in those days had its roots in Methodism. I believe that both went together. Men were both religious and socialists at the same time. Uh, today, there are people who wonder whether they've got either their socialism or their religion. And along the streets of Ronda stand the chapels, islands isolated now in a sea of materialism. They're there. They're like empty shells. In fact, they dot the landscape of this valley like extinct volcanoes. These large, barrack-looking, austere buildings are empty. And there you have the transformation that has taken place. For our boys, we're going to have a new barn here in the Gorsh. And for our boys, we're going to have a new voices. And we're going to have a new baby in Israel. We're going to have a new one in our boys. We're going to have a new one in our boys. It is true that they are no longer volcanic, but I do not think that they are in any way becoming extinct. Yet the valley is to survive in any cultural, political, and religious sense. There surely must be a burning again of the old volcanoes. attendance and an aging membership, the chapels that could between them seat Ronva's entire population now echo no more with a packed chorus of praise and worship. Some are shut, some sold to very different use. But some, like Nazareth at Penagraig, have been rebuilt to a social purpose. I like actually the situation of one or two churches that have been sold to the Ronda Council, where the development is a communal development where chapels are used for definitely new ways and new means of expression. And I think that the churches failed to realize that a part of its message was to enter more fully into the community. Those churches that have been changed, say, to voluntary centers or old people centers, whatever they are, community centers, they have been organized with a, with a body that has capital. They can, they can use money to that purpose. Nothing from Rhonda's social and cultural history has survived more strongly than the urge to be educated and to educate others. This was formerly a colliery site, derelict for many years afterwards, and the people have been inclined to look at this place as if it's abandoned, something like the valley itself. But no, what has happened is that on this old disused site, a miracle has taken place. An imaginative modern school to meet the needs of the modern child. <laughs> can have 
all kinds of education to suit not only what the Rwanda needs, but what the large is looking for. We are trying in the school to get parents to think that there are opportunities not only in the valley but outside. They know that apprenticeships of varying kinds um, are waiting their children just the outside the valley. That's going to break down the idea that uh, the Ronde is parochial and uh, that we are inbreeding. We hope that this school is an attempt to grow up educationally as well as uh, reach out to the modern world. Much of Rhonda's schooling is still housed in the old formal style, but well over a third of these children go on from junior school to grammar school, urged on by parents and by long tradition. Rhonda people felt that education was a kind of ladder which allowed them to climb out of the pit. Unfortunately, at this time, the educational system was largely self-generating. The products of the system led back into education and nowhere else so Rwanda produced teachers there was little opportunity for anything else now however industry the professions government service who the sick former with attractions which teaching cannot equal the pull is now from a broad front in the language laboratory of a Rondra grammar school, these youngsters are a long way from the darkness and danger their forefathers knew at the same age. Today, they are heirs to a new and much more equal society. I have 500 boys in the school. Their parents come from all walks of life. The boys themselves are not conscious of differences in wealth, differences in social position, they are conscious only of differences in ability, differences in capacity for work, and excellence in games. And sixth form Ronda is conscious too of the need to argue and to look critically at its formative background of valley life. The basic snag of existence here is the fact that we are all still under the rather vicious thumb of the Puritan nonconformity of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We, we are still held by reactionary forces. Yeah, I uh, don't think this has any real effect on us today. I know it has well, no effect, oh, very little well, effect I, on me. I, I now, don't the, think it's going to have the damage, real effect The damage on which me. this growing up uh, uh, under these um, stifling influences has already been done. I should say we'll all, we'll all go from here and whether we like it or not we are going to have a Puritan background whether we like it or not we've got it ground into us. No, I, I think this, um, there is con uh, conformity, this great sense of conformity uh, is a snag in a way. You take it now, well since the time of the Depression anyway the Rondas returned to Parliament at each election a socialist candidate with an overwhelming majority even though the one that tends to be conservative well what i mean we can only but we well conservative in outlook not conservative <laughs> in policy yes um that we can only attribute this to this uh, sense of conformity the sort of follow the herd idea and it doesn't matter who who the labor party puts up for election they can stick a dollar there for that <laughs> you'll get the parliament but this conformity, this single way of life in a mining valley, is breaking down into diversity. To Ron Berry, it will die as memory dies of the sour industrial past. Oh, I'm sure the fag end of racial memory exists now, you know, in, uh, probably in the council chambers and in pubs and clubs among people of my generation and a little older. Perhaps it's, it's a nasty taste in a lot of people's mouths, probably, but uh, I'm sure it'll die, I'm sure it'll fade away as the history of the Ronda itself is fading away, you know. Which isn't to say that these things, when they occurred, weren't vital, because the Ronda obviously gave a social impetus and gave social values 
to industry throughout the whole world, probably. These valleys and the life in these streets have inspired many writers, but few artists. One of them, Ernest Zabole, has come back to his native valley to live and to paint. As he says, coming back here was like climbing back into a warm bed. Briefly, it's the place which interests me, um, rather than the people. But then that's not quite right, because you can't help thinking of people. The people who inhabit wrong the streets, when you look at these streets. Uh, well, this is one painting that I've um, made, which has been influenced by the Ronda. Um, although I've been interested in form again in doing this thing. And in the painting here, there is the horizon at the top and bottom, with the center of the valley, as it were, down through the middle. And towards the center, there is a street with a person, and there are windows through which you can see people, some in bed, some just looking out. And the whole thing, I hope, is something woven, which gives you an idea of the valley. That gentleman from the middle section after the chord of F minor. Would you... Even the traditional repertoire of the male choirs is breaking with past conformity. Penderis, one of Ronda's two big choirs, rehearses in a schoolroom under Glyn Jones and exults in Latin in a mass by Perosi. By again watching the ending and giving me good, clear tones. Right, Brian, when you're ready. is developing its own institution and making the clubs a place of grandeur and likewise a place where they can turn in, they can sit down, they can talk, they can speak, they can sing. All their interests actually are being provided for them. Here is a tremendous change. The club today as a center of the communal life and the church, as it were, perishing on the circumference. Legs 11, walking sticks 77, 8 and 3, 83, bed and breakfast 2 and 6, 7 and 1, 71, 3 and 2, 32, key of the door 21. the new pattern of Ronda life, the old pattern of death strikes savagely and suddenly. 
Along the silent streets, the dead miners of Cambrian are escorted to their long home. And Ronza watches in shocked anger that it could have happened again in 1965. One by one, the latticed memorials of past labor are stripped and felled. In 1913, there were 53 pits in Ronda. Today, there are six, and an economic question mark hangs over each of them. In the days when pit wheels turned, or failed to turn, at the end of every street, there was often little to buy in the shops, and often nothing to buy it with. Today, shop windows match the shopping purse, and the cafes share this affluence. Instead of pop and pies and politics, there are menus now of distinction. In Ronda, there's money to spare for most of the pleasures. Housing is still a major concern for the borough. The long lines of aging houses, though painted and refurbished with pride, are too small for easy conversion. New flats and new council estates are building, high on the hilltops above the valley, in a cleaner air perhaps, but a cooler social climate than that of the terraces along the river. The Civic Trust has proposed a new centre for Ronda, where the two valleys meet at Port, and says the next generation must have an environment to match the dramatic change from the past. But to a generation like Will Mainwaring's, much of the future lies elsewhere. From the mining angle, uh, there is no future in the sense that we knew Ronda. The question of uh, suitable employment is one uh, that can only be decided outside of Ronda itself. Call it a dormitory town, if you like. But there must be suitable employment provided within easy traveling distance. And in that way, Ronda can have a long history. At the mouth of the last private level in Ronda, we are looking back into history. This is how it all began. When and how will it end? Despite pit closures and the threat of more closures to come, this is the future as Gerald Blackmore sees it. I believe the um, future of the valley is not suspect in terms of the market for coal. South Wales is particularly fortunate in the very high grades of coal, which um, were laid down many, many millions of years ago. And therefore, I believe they will always be in demand. As far as Rwanda is concerned, we are rich in coal for many, many decades to come, if we have the manpower to work. Okay. These are independent miners, five men who work this level as a private venture. They admit they're making a good living out of it, but even they are pessimistic about the future of coal in Rwanda. Well, I'll give you my opinion. Mining came into this valley the way we are mining it by us. And I think that's the way it's going to go out. Come in the levers, and it's going to finish with the level then. I think this will be the last Navali. I don't think the valley itself has got long to go. I wish it had a good future, but uh, I think the coal owners took the best of it. It's gone. Perhaps, as these men claim, we're near the twilight end of the Ronda miners' day. But for the long street that is Ronda, surely it's only the end of the beginning. Perhaps Will Whitehead speaks for most of Ronda when he says, My view for what it's worth is that there will be limited employment in the Ronda, limited population, a much more beautiful place to live in, and much the same in terms of debate and argument as went on before. The Bible has history, mm -hmm. and he advised me to read it, uh, thinking it would change my mind about things. So I, I had done a bit of economic geography, and I found 
uh, to the old leaders, the beginning of the world was the Old Testament. Yes, that's quite right. But we find by study that it was not so. We find the first history we've got, anything beyond this must be for the anthropologist. Yes. But the first history we have got is of the river civilizations, yes. the sewers, uh, particularly the Euphrates, yes. and they were confined within their own areas owing to particular geographical conditions. The sea and the sun protected them from what they term marauding tribes. Mm. And, yes. But the Mesopotamian people, uh, the Euphrates, uh, they weren't quite so confined, and they did spread out uh, before the Egyptians. You see, after a period of years, some thousands of years, these people discovered that everything wasn't uh, desert. They discovered that there was a fertile crescent around the north of the Arabian desert. Mm -hmm. I'm only saying this because we must start beginning the story from the beginning. You are leading on, I presume, to Abraham. No, wait a minute, no. Abraham, uh, these people broke out almost simultaneously. Yes. The Egyptians went out the line. Yes. They were forced to, by economic conditions, they had got too many. Mm. But Abram was the cutest, you see. Now, I, I have been taught that Abram was working entirely that the call from God to go and do this, that, and the other. But my opinion is that Abram was pretty well off according to history, but he knew there was more wealth in the north. But when and he, he went, went up uh, after it, let me finish William. my story now. Yes, yes. He went up north and came around this fertile crescent and the Egyptians coming up from the south, mm. they met at what we know as Palestine today. Right. And from there on, it was nothing but war, war, war between one tribe and another, uh, which gives you the Old Testament. That is the history of the Old Testament of these internecine wars that were taking place in and around there. And afterwards, of course, you grow up into Greek, Persia, and all the rest of it until the present day. How do you look at Abraham William? As an adventurer only? Mainly, yes. Like oh, a man. No, no, no. Uh, well, Abraham, was, that, Abraham was a holy man, right, a man right, of vision, right. a man of magnanimity. I've got to remember too that a lot of the colliery managers and agents were only men too, but they wouldn't give you. They wanted no, only only in name, William. Yes, well, only in name. they wanted a lot for a shilling everywhere I went yes. anyway. When I was in school, compulsory free education. I paid to go to school. I paid to go to school. But mm -hmm. the new act came in while I was in school. It would be about 1900, 1890. Mm -hmm. But the point is this. The employers were looking for clerks and people to count the other people's pay and nobody was educated. So they brought education in, I say, for that. Not for, uh, for my benefit, but for their own. Ah, uh, is education and culture the main goal in life? Yes, half a minute now. We were talking about leadership this minute. Yes. Well, now, there is a new leadership emerging, and has been for a long time. Yes. The young 
people today are asking the way of things. And they are realizing that in the old days, they say, keep in with the manager, the manager, and, and you must be a good boy and all this, you see. But it doesn't work. But I should like to come from the pits yeah. out to the crowd. Oh, well, I'm only concerned with the pits. That's where I had my bread and butter. And you know what it says in, uh, in the Merchant of Venice? He, the quality of mercy well, yeah, is not strange. No, not the prophet that. has a gentle rain no. from heaven no. on the place beneath. No, not that. first place. No. He owns my life who owns the means by which I live. That's right. where I come. There's one quotation that appeals to me always when I'm in my best moments. And they are from a lyric by J.G. Holland, that great lyricist. And he's saying something like this, God give us men, men, my dear, a time like this demands. Strong minds, great hearts, true faith, and ready hands. Men whom the lust of office cannot kill. Men whom the spoils of office cannot buy. Men who possess opinions and their will. Men who love honor, men who never lie. Why can't we have them today? Because these, they didn't, their horizon was too narrow. The people today are but a wider. The whole world is embraced. Not only the chapel and the London Valley, but the whole world is embraced in their outlook. How is it that people are turning back to religion in the end? Puzzles me. Take David Hume, for instance. The rationalist and the infidel. He had been preaching the gospel throughout his life. Not believing in God, not believing in the universe, not believing in anything. Only that man was a human being and a slave to evolution and progress. But in the end, David Hume was dying. And he called on his mother and he said, Mother, can you help me this morning? I am facing the unknown. Have you got anything to say to me? And, she said, and the old lady said, well, David, you've been preaching, you've been an infidel throughout your life. What light do you want? Ah, he said, today I'm facing reality, she said. I'm facing God and eternity. Is that right? How is it that people are turning back, William, to religion in the end? Well, I don't know, nor I don't deny religion. You see, I know you are a very religious man, mm -hmm. and I respect you. But what I am trying to say is this, that religion has never done anything to alter the social and economic position of the masses. I believe that the masses themselves have got to do it, not through religion or anything else, but through knowledge of their environment, knowing what, what causes this, why wars, why this bother in the Congo? Why in Kenya? Why in Laos? There is, there is an answer to all of them. I think I'll have this one. You do not add. The Sunset Street Tree by Mother Tenso. Romance again, is it, Ed? Yes, I like that, I like that one. Let's have a look, we were in India. There we are. Look at, uh, look at this. Tears brightened the flesh on her cheeks, and he gently kissed her mouth. The, the old boys, years ago, they wouldn't look as ambitious as this. Well, Brenda, them mother ones are too high for me. Well, look at the stuff we've got here. Geology. Science. Geography, even mining here, yeah, things like that. Talking about the war, you know, 
I remember one night going for a walk on the Hindenburg line. That was a very strong line. We never took it, really. And uh, an old pal of mine, a Scotland, and Scotchman, and we went for a walk through a village that had been for about a mile long, and everything was demolished. But the air raid came on, and uh, the only th place where we could take shelter was the arch of an old pig cot that hadn't been blown in. Mm. We were both sheltering under there when a soldier came down, walking down the same way from the towards the line. And the question he put to us, which stung, stung us for a minute, he said, where's that cafe with that girl in? And old Jock was more quick with that than me. Oh, you go straight down, he said, and turn to the left. you find her down there. Well, I don't think there was a bird alive around there, leave alone a girl. A very curious incident happened at Southampton. The evening before we embarked on active service. I remember three of us, three bosom pounds, going to a phrenologist, a renowned phrenologist that had, and I remember spending the last ten shillings of English money that I had in my possession. We went in, see this man, and I was the last to go in. He asked several questions, and he spoke to me just the same as if he had been living next door to me when I was a child. Everything that happened in my life Early life, this man mentioned that. So when everything was over, he invited questions. Three questions from each of us. And it came to my turn to answer my questions. So I asked him, same as you've been saying today, William, how long is this war going to last? I was under the impression six months. He said, oh, my dear man, he said, it's 19, 14, I'll speak to you probably 1919, he said, well, that dropped my sales terribly. He said, have you got another thing that you'd like to ask? I said, yes. After being through it all, are we going to return? And he hesitated a little and said, uh, the first two, they will not return. But you will return, he said. You'll go to a hospital and you'll go through the tribulations of war, but you will come back safely. Well, I was the only one that came back out of the field. Human beings are the work of God. You know we're talking about France now, during the war. Did you see any village without a red lamp or a white lamp or a green lamp? Not on your I life, you towns, didn't. I saw towns with red lamps but no villages. Aye, ah, villages behind the line, Bethune for one. Oh yes, I agree, Bethune. Yes, there was one there. Only a small town. Armentiers, another, not more than a village. Of course they were there. If it wasn't for that and the rum, do you think that war would have lasted so long? The morale would have gone to blazes, 
But you take a lad of 18, 18 and a half. The day they were 18 and a half, they were sent out to France. And you landed them in Liave for a rest camp for a couple of days. But everybody took care that they go, went out into the town. And almost everyone who visited the Rue de Gallian in Liave, because you couldn't go in the wrong house there. The red caps were lined all over the place so that they guided you as if you were going to see Cardiff City Football Club. The only thing was, oh, I'm telling the gospel truth. The only thing was that there were red caps at the bottom of the street that you couldn't go through anywhere else. You had to come back the same way. Mm. Yeah. But France was a model before the First World War, you know. I know, but you see... And the continent the same. Yes, they're trying to stamp it out. They're no. trying to stamp it out. But you just think of the effect of, the, of a youngster then. Because we were pretty well Victorian in 1914, you know. She hadn't oh, been dead only 14 yes, years. Yes, I agree. See, a boy 18 and a half had never seen anything above a woman's boot because when they went to France and see the women with dresses up to here, by God, they'd stop and look. <laughs> they'd never seen a woman's legs, man. Even, uh, I tell you, it, it, they didn't think about the war, see? No. I tell my children, when I look at the medals, they call them badges. Here's the symbol of my ignorance. Because that's what it was for me to be there. And I say that as long as I live. Because if I'd known then what I know now, I wouldn't be in no war without I was carried there. No. You know, David, during the war, there's one thing I learned from the war, First World War. I found everything was so well organized. I'm not saying about the, what caused the war or anything of that kind, but whilst you were there, the organization of food, munitions, men, everything was perfect. And I came to the conclusion myself that if we can organize the society for war, why not for peace? And as a result of that, when the war was over, we were a dozen of us from Lancum who came down to Trebert and even carried coal in a fish bag to light the fire in the room we had. And we'd got a tutor to teach us industrial history because we thought, well, something wrong somewhere and we wanted to know the reason why. And we carried on with these classes until the strike of 1926. I left school at 11. And in this adult school, uh, we didn't have no strangers to lecture. It was just the members of the class. We had a Treber schoolmaster as the leader. And I must say, he was a brilliant chap. And he said one Sunday, I'd never written a paper in my life. And he said one Sunday, Mr. Thomas Blancombe will give us a paper on the Renaissance next Sunday. Mm. Well, that knocked me for six, but I didn't know the meaning of the word Renaissance. And I took all that week and a bit of help from other people, and I wrote a paper anyway. And it, as I'm telling you, people want to know why. And I've been looking out the history of the Renaissance, and I've got it pretty well, I think.
You just think of the Archbishop of Canterbury going to meet the Pope after 600 years. The establishment, uh, unfortunately, are a step in front of the people. They are a step in front all the time. They are preparing to their defenses because they, they know they know what's happening in the world. Well, where, where is the remedy for communism, rationalism, atheism, mm. socialism? In reason. In alone, one word. Alone? alone? In, in reason. reason. Look, one thing I learned years ago when I went in for ambulance work, and you know, I found it very valuable in other departments of life. You were taught to find the reason. Before you can treat anybody for first aid, you must know what's wrong. It might be under a fall, remove the fall. If he's under a motor car, but if he's taking poison, you must try and find out whether he's taking acid or alkaline, and you counter it. And there is, and I tell you, the people of the world are marching on. Well, do you think that Kipling, he's been on the wireless, we've heard a lot about yes. him, and I'm a great admirer of Kipling. Yes. Uh, is Kipling correct in this statement, in this quotation? East is East and West is West. He didn't say and that. Mark Twain said no, that. No, no, East is East <laughs> and West is West and never the Twain shall meet. That's right, Mark Twain said that. Well, it was quoted. Yes, yes, that is wrong, see. Mm. Mark. And do you think that they will meet, even if it is Mark Twain? Meet? They're on the way, boy. They're on the way. I remember in my early years, time was boredom. But now, after passing the span of 70 years, I can see time going very, very, very fast. Of course, we are the creatures of time. We haven't got any conception of anything apart from time. We were born in time. But the day will come when eternity will swallow up time. Then what's going to happen? Well, I look at it this way, it's eternity for somebody every day. Somebody is going to eternity every day. Yes, what about day. us, William? Not the man next door. What about us? I think of life, I'm going back to my boy days, days I'm very sorry to say that I wasted to a certain extent, but now life to me is nothing but a series of farewells in a world full of changes. Read the papers or the periodicals. Farewell here and farewell there. And life to me, after analyzing it, is nothing but a series of farewells. At my age, I'm looking for something better. Time, baby, sends away. Time is like a running stream. 
but I stand firm on one thing. Christ is my salvation and the great principles on the mount, they stand like the rock of ages itself and there I stand and no one will move me from there. What do you say, William? Well, I would like to attempt to move you from your point of view on anything, but as regards to time, I will agree with you that time does seem to go much faster now as we get older. When we were young, we were looking forward towards something. We were going to do wonders when we get older, but we just haven't done those things. We have grown old without knowing to ourselves. But the only thing I can see constant in life is change, perpetual change. I think there's a wonderful time before humanity. Wonderful. Time, a kind of time undreamt of. When man will be man. Man is not man as yet. Man is in his general infancy. He's not, we haven't realized that we are men. 